All right, so uh, Minkowski, by the way, uh, Minkowski diagrams, um, that's, they're synonymous with space-time diagrams. So I'll use these words interchangeably. And Minkowski was a, a contemporary of Einstein, so he was, um, he dealt a little more, more with the kind of the strictly mathematical interpretation or, or, or development of things, whereas Einstein was equally concerned with the physical development and, and how to physically, you know, interpret these mathematical um, oddities. And so uh, basically what, what Minkowski did, and there, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more once we talk about the linear algebra of space-time, the, the last topic here, but he, he, he was able to partly incorporate the transformations of relativity into like a a fairly straightforward linear algebra based, like matrix and, and row vector, column vector uh, based analysis. And so we'll get to that a little later, but his other, he's, he's also, um, these diagrams are kind of known for him because it's a visual way of rep representing the separation between not just points in space time, but we call them events. And the basic way we do this is we, um, yeah, I'm just gonna do the general way here. So first of all, we make a y-axis, and typically um, this would be viewed as as like you know space, or you know you plot like uh, distance versus time. This is now going to be time. So the y-axis as you go up indicates time increasing. Now, uh, one of the things you can ask is whose time. Uh, observer S, observer S prime, and whatnot. So I'm going to kind of ignore that question for now, but we'll see what which one of those two it has to be. And then on this axis here, we're going to indicate um, space, or the spatial dimensions. And I will write that more generally. So, you know, we can kind of, and it, there's not really, it doesn't matter, right or left is positive, it's just space. But um, in this case here though, the reason why I'm saying spatial dimensions is that we, we know we have three, three spatial dimensions of our universe, or at least, um, well, we believe we have three spatial dimensions. Uh, we know quite well we have three large scale macroscopic spatial dimensions. If string theory is right, by the way, there may be another six or maybe another um, something like 13 extra hidden dimensions that are all curled up on tiny microscopic scales that you can't travel through on macroscopic, um, like above quantum scale uh, dimensions. Uh, we're going to ignore that, and we're going to assume that we're actually correct in our intuition. There are three space dimensions, and we're going to essentially compactify these space dimensions into one single axis. So we're not going to be concerned about X or, or Y per se right now. Now, in a moment, I will redraw this diagram and we'll focus on like quadrant, row, quadrant one and we will focus only on the X spatial dimension. But for now, you could allow these to be all three spatial dimensions kind of combined into a single axis here. So a couple important points here. Right here at the origin, this is the current um, or what well, the, the origin or the current space-time event. Now remember the word event simply means it's a ordered pair X, Y, Z, T. So it's the same thing as coordinate, but we simply use a different name when we talk about a four-dimensional space-time. So this is now our our you know the current position, the current time, it's where our spatial origin lies. And generally, we will talk about this a little bit more. Um, in, in depth here, but we can trace what's called world lines on this diagram. So a world line, and I am going to start using the other board here. Okay, so a world line is the, I'll use a mathematical term, it's the locus of all points that, uh, de that designate a given object's space-time event coordinates. Or in other words, said more simply, it's the trajectory of an object through space-time. So, I mean, it's, it's exactly the same as, you know, drawing out something's X, Y, Z trajectory or path. Uh, but in this case, now we're having four dimensions here. Again, this, the, the horizontal one corresponds with three physical dimensions. 
And so, for example, we can trace some really kind of uh, basic examples of world lines here. Now, if we consider number one, uh, the world line of an object that is at rest, it remains at its origin for all time. That's a really simple world line to draw here. And I'll draw it like this. So this is the world line here. It's at x equals y equals z equals zero. So the spatial component is zero at all times. And as time goes forward, it just remains at the origin. So this is a stationary world line. And the next thing we can draw here is let's say there is some object that, um, let's choose one direction of motion and we'll focus only on that. So let's say it, it happens to be moving in what we're gonna call the X direction. Um, if not, you just reorient your, your coordinate system so that they are in fact moving in what you're calling the X direction. And now we can draw the world line for a moving object and specifically, we're gonna, we're gonna allow, allow that object to pass directly through our origin at t equals zero, according to us. So we're gonna intersect at exactly right there. And specifically, if this other object is moving in the forwards spatial dimension here, it will look like this. Now, I, I try to draw that as a straight line and I suck at art, but there we go. And so this is a, we'll call it a slowly moving world line. And we will actually um, uh, write the equations that, that govern these, these lines here in a moment, but I want to pause on that for a moment, um, because what I want to consider now is what will the world lines look like? If, and by the way, um, this is indicating a, a slowly moving but consistently moving object its velocity is not changing, so as it moves through space, the essentially the slope of it, I mean, that's literally what it is, the slope remains constant at all times. I don't want to consider non-inertial frames, meaning frames that go this way and they back up and they go forwards. Those are not inertial frames and I will, con I, I will ignore those. So if we look at an object that's moving faster and faster, literally, that they, they cover, so we have to think of this as kind of the flip of our normal spa, uh, time versus distance graphs. So in this case here, a perfectly vertical line means no motion. If it's moving slowly, we start to see it tilt more and more. Now, we could, in theory, imagine something that's moving faster and faster. In other words, the line is tilted greater and greater. But at some point, we're going to hit a physically, you know, a, 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 the realm where that slope becomes physically impossible. Uh, and where would that occur? What, what factor might limit how steep that line has to be? Okay, so to kind of reiterate that, uh, we, can, we can imagine greater and greater velocities, meaning that the slope of this line, the, the distance that it covers for some amount of time is gonna be greater and greater, but at some point, we, we have to start considering what would the graph of an object that looks, that's going basically the speed of light look like? Because we know an object can't cover more than one light year of distance for a year of time. And to make this even slightly more clear, I'm gonna try to indicate exactly what my units are on the space axis and the time axis. And as, as we should get used to doing here, when we're measuring space and time at the same time, we should be using compatible units. So if we're measuring time in seconds, the logical distance unit is light seconds. If we're measuring time in years, we want to use light years. And why is that? The, the, the short answer here, and, and this is what a lot of relativists, relativists would tell you, it's because C equals one. Uh, the speed of light is one light year per year, or the speed of light is one light second per second. So as long as you use those compatible units, C is always gonna equal one, meaning you don't even need to include C at all, which is a, a nice handy thing to be able to disregard when you have like 75 pages of math. So um, in this case here, I'm gonna label this distance right here, for example, as one light year, or equivalently light second or whatever it could, once needs to be. And then this one right here, I'm simply gonna label as one year. So when I make my, my notches on my grid here, 
one you know, inch that way will be the equivalent of one inch that way, two inches that way, two inches that way. Once you, once you state them in the appropriate other compatible unit. And so what that means, the most distance any object could cover in the horizontal direction is one in one unit of time. One light year in year, one light second in second. In other words, we have a nice 45 degree angle that tells us exactly the fastest speed you could ever be going at. And I will draw that right here. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna get rid of those. This right here is going to be what we call a light-like world line. And I'll try to be entirely clear on why that must be true. At one year of time, we'll have gone one light year of distance. At two years of time, we'll have gone two light years of distance three years of time, we'll have gone three light years of distance, and so on. So this line right here has a slope of exactly one, or one year for every light year, and this is exactly the path that, uh, for example, a beam of light would take through the universe. It's going to go exactly on this trajectory. Okay, so let's go ahead and draw our origin right here. And again, everything else is going to relate back to that point. So we're, we are going to assume that this is our current position, that Every piece of information we know about the universe, we know at that position in space and time. And I'm going to go, go ahead and draw in a couple important kind of subdivisions here. First, I'm going to draw a light-like trajectory for light going in this direction. Um, and by the way, it might be helpful to, to now start thinking about this axis simply just as one direction of space. And so we're only going to consider motion in the x direction. So if you want, you can think of this as x, for example. So I'm going to go ahead and draw the, the light-like trajectory here. And this is a light-like trajectory going in the plus direction. So if there's a beam of light coming this way, this is its world line through space-time. And then I'm going to do the exact same thing for a beam of light going in the opposite direction. So it starts off here in the positive direction, and it goes negatively at the speed of light again. So in this case here, let me do that correctly. So these are the two uh, essentially opposing light-like trajectories. And now if you notice this, you know, we originally had our space dimension and time dimension here, and that, you know, that naturally divides a, a graph into four quadrants. We've done exactly the same thing with these two world lines now, except the four quadrants are flipped 45 degrees from a standard xy axis. And the more important thing now is that these four quadrants actually indicate very separate regions of the universe. And the reason for that is as follows. If you imagine some observer right here, and if we imagine all of the possible trajectories that observer could take, if he is currently at the origin there at t equals zero, if you include all the possible world lines that person could possibly achieve beginning there, it's going to look like this. That person could be at rest. Go there. That person would be going slowly to the right. That person would be going slowly to the left. Going more quickly to the right. More quickly left. Even faster. Now, his world lines, his potentially achievable world lines, consume the entirety of this top cone. And that's exactly what we call it. So every single point of space-time up here in, that, in this cone, on the inside of this cone, is potentially a position this person could get to if he was right there at t equals zero. Does that make sense? Does, does this region of the grid, can you see how you can always get from this person to any point as long as you're within that cone there? So we give a name for this, and when you, di when, when you basically divide this diagram up into these quadrants, this region, everything up here, becomes the, the set of all the points that you can connect an actual world line to, 
and it's bounded by the speed of light positively and the speed of light negatively. So the name we give for this is a light cone. And specifically, it's the light cone in future, or light cone of future events. So we call this the future light cone. And the fact that we use the word cone might be a little bit confusing, but let me kind of explain why that actually makes a lot of sense. And I will probably feature terrible artwork as I do so, so just uh, bear with me here. Um, but, you know, when I'd said that we're gonna view this as the, I'll just do solid lines, time, and this is space, we can imagine adding at least one more axis here, space like that, so it's a normal x, y, z. So x and y, we're still not drawing our, our third dimension z, but if we, if we now view like a two-dimensional flat grid of, of space, so we have a, a flat plane of space and light protruding up, what this light cone now looks like is we start there, the speed of light, if it's going in the x direction, would look like this, negative x like that. In the y direction now, we, we can now start making this look kind of three-dimensional, and this becomes kind of like a, a cone oops, that stretches out as the speed of light expands in all directions. And so inside of that cone, and I, like I said, I can't actually draw this properly here. This, this should be dashed. Um, inside of this cone, everything inside of the cone here is the future light cone. So you can choose to go in the x direction, y direction in some combination, but no faster than the speed of light. So it's still this 45 degree kind of conical shape. Okay, and now we're gonna do the exact same thing back into the past. So we're gonna take the set of all points at previous times that this person might have potentially come from. And since nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, nothing outside of this, for example, you can't connect the dots from something here outside of that light cone to there because they would actually have to travel faster than the speed of light their slope would be greater than that. And that's a really important point. You can never connect an object outside of that past light cone to the origin there unless you, unless you travel faster than the speed of light. So everything on this side here, on the bottom of the light cone, it's the set of all events that possibly could have, uh, that, that you could translate that person backwards into the past, and they could have traveled from point A to there less than the speed of light. So we call this the past light cone. And again, to be entirely um, uh, clear, what I mean by that is you can take any arbitrary point, we'll call it uh, space-time event A, and you can always connect that space-time event A to the origin there by telling them to go at some certain speed that is less than the speed of light. Um, if you want to differentiate between the, pa the past and the future light cones here, the, you know, instead of just thinking about a trajectory that the person can achieve from point A to B or B to C or whatever, um, it's not just that we're, met with, that we're sending people across the universe. Um, the universe will exist whether or not there's people. But the better way to view this, and the way that most physicists uh, do actually talk about it as, is the future light cone consists of all the points of space-time, or more specifically, all the events of space-time, that you could send a signal from the origin to. And, or or it, that you can send information. So every point up here in this future light cone could be influenced by that original origin point there. This point could send information to every single event within that future light cone because it ha it, it's able to do so sending it at, at most the speed of light. Now, the way that you would send information is you send a pulse of a, you know, a, a beam of light and you know, it's, it's, it goes from point A to point B at the speed of light. It's absorbed. The person has a minute to think about what to do based on that information. Everything up here in the future light cone can be influenced, in theory, by the origin. So 
So it's kind of like an influence cone. This person could send out a signal, and in theory, every one of the future light cone can act on that same signal. And the past light cone, if you want to think of it that way, every position down here in the past light cone, in theory, can send a signal, and that information can be received by an observer there, traveling at most or, or less than the speed of light. So every point in the past light cone, in theory, can influence the observer's decision at t equals zero. So if we view it this way, we're now talking about events not just like, you know, generically viewed by some imaginary grid in our minds, we're actually now physically describing the regions of the universe that can and cannot communicate with each other. And that's why this is a fundamentally more important diagram than a standard like XY position versus time graph. Because we've now isolated the regions of the universe that can speak with each other. And the word we give to that is that these regions are what we call causally connected. And I'll write that up here. But that means that an event in this region here, and I will give these labels now, I'll call this region one like that. And I'll call this region two like that. Events in region one can cause something to occur there. And events in region two can be caused by something that's occurring there. So these regions are, are causally connected. And that's the term that we use. When we say causally connected, all that means is they can be influenced by each other. And I'm not going to write that down partly because I've run out of room. So, by the way, I usually, um, at the beginning of my semester, I give a, a at minimum one coffee spill guarantee. Um, I didn't think I'd have to worry about that this semester, but <laughs> not the case. <laughs> um, oh, okay, one more thing here. And, and this is a direct you know, antithesis of this. So if these regions here that I've drawn in red are causally connected to the origin, they can, they can cause something to happen or they can affect something later. Then what about these regions out here? The regions that I'm drawing in blue. And by the way, on that kind of the, the more 3D version of this graph, this blue region here is actually almost like kind of, a, it's a torus that wraps around. You know, kind of think of a, a triangular torus when you wrap it around a pole like that. So this is really one very vast region of space-time, you know, wraps around like this if you view these as cones. So I'm just simply going to refer to that entire region there as 3. All of region 3 is outside of the past or future light cones, or it is not causally connected to the regions inside of them. Now, to be clear, you could choose a space-time event right there. And you could choose another space-time event, let's say, right there. Can those two influence, influence each other? Yeah, absolutely. You could very easily send a, you know, send a signal traveling at a rather low rate and connect point A to point B there. But what you can't do is send a signal from, say, point A to the origin, or, or for example, from the origin to point A. And the reason for that is that the fastest any signal could go from the origin is at the speed of light on that green path. If it were to try to reach point A from the origin, it would have to take this trajectory, meaning that it's going more than one light year for every year. So event A that I've drawn right there is not causally connected for the origin, because in order to transfer signals between them, the only possible way would be to send signals faster than the speed of light. So this whole region that I've drawn in blue here is the, is the uh, I don't know if there's a proper name for it, but it's the region outside of the light cone where all the events in blue are not causally connected. So I want to go a little bit further with this, but I'm, I'm going to need to erase the board and everything um, and just check in. Um, any thoughts on this? <laughs>